Welcome to Wider View, the program that provides perspectives on the news outside the narrow confines of the mainstream media. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. I'm very pleased to welcome Mark Sloboda back to Wider View. Mark is an international affairs and security analyst for RT, a former senior researcher at the Sociological Faculty of Moscow State University, and a former nuclear reactor operator for the United States Navy. Mark is currently based in Moscow. I began by asking Mark about the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty signed by President Reagan and USSR General Secretary Gorbachev in the late 1980s that was recently suspended by both the United States and the Russian Federation, each accusing the other of having broken it. Maybe you can tell us why this treaty was important and what happened here. Yeah, okay, so th this treaty was signed in 1987. It, it was a, a landmark treaty, and it formed one of the, the pillars of the foundation of the Cold War security architecture. The rules of the road that at least provided a modicum of order and respect that the Cold War lacked, that this emerging global great power conflict that we have right now uh, doesn't have. And actually, um, the United States was very, very surprised when uh, Reagan uh, initially proposed this idea and a short time later Gorbachev came back and said, let's do it. Because um, this treaty um, is was, particularly at the time, still is, extremely advantageous to the United States. Now, what the treaty does is it bans all short and medium range missiles and launchers uh, between 500 and uh, 5,500 uh, kilometers distance, which is uh, about up to 3,300 and some miles. Um, but it only bans uh, land-based missiles. Okay. Now, this is conventional and nuclear because you, you can't really distinguish between the two of them. Most such missiles can easily be configured to carry a nuclear warhead, right? So you, you have to ban all missiles. And this was a bilateral treaty between the Soviet Union and the United States, and it was carried on uh, to, to Russia as the legal successor of the Soviet Union. Now, the reason this treaty was so advantageous to the U.S. is it does not ban sea and air launched missiles doesn't ban them at all and the u.s is a maritime power it has a powerful navy and air force whereas russia is a terrestrial land-based continental power and much less powerful uh navy and air force because of the concentration on on conventional land forces so the soviet generals when 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 gorbachev agreed to this were quite aghast I mean, they were they were flat out furious. They 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 did not want to sign this. Um, but Gorbachev was was very hot on on moving out of the Cold War era conflict, and and he agreed to it. This was a treaty about Europe. This was a treaty about protecting Europe and Western Russia, and getting these short and intermediate range missiles out of Europe. Right. And uh, we're talking about the Pershings from the U.S. and the SS-20s uh, from the Soviet Union. Uh, the Soviet Union destroyed uh, uh, almost twice as many missiles as a result of this treaty as the United States did. So it, 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 it took much deeper losses. One of the reasons why these missiles, at least in their nuclear variant, are so dangerous is because they're so close to the opponent. And they hit so quickly with such a short uh, response time. And the danger here, of course, is decision making. Because when you detect a missile being launched from the opponent, uh, you have only a limited amount of time to try to verify that missile, verify uh, the intent, verify who launched it, verify... Was it a mistake? Is your data correct? Right. We've seen multiple. We saw multiple instances in the Cold War on both sides of faulty missile launch readings that, thank God, were 
analyzed and detected in time as being false. And there was uh, at least two on both sides during the Cold War, possibly more. Um, so it re reduces decision making time. And of course, it's, it also makes Europe a target. Uh, it was it, it would have left Europe a wasteland. Um, and, and what this did is, is basically make Europe, um, at least as far as short and intermediate range land based missiles, a, a, uh, a nuke free zone. Or, of course, it didn't affect ICBMs. We know the U.S. had ICBMs in, in Europe, right? And, 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 uh, and everything. And you can always fire an intercontinental a long range, you know, an ICBM at shorter range, right? You know, there's nothing preventing you from firing it at a shorter range, too, if you really wanted to. But of course, the U.S. and Russia were primarily focused on each other. And the START Treaty and the New START Treaty limited the amount of warheads that you, uh, missiles and warheads that you had. So you wanted to prioritize those, uh, as you could. Um, so uh, along with the, the START and then the New START Treaty, this, these were, this was the, the pillar of Cold War strategic security architecture. Now, most of the other architect security architecture of the Cold War has already been abandoned. The U.S. has already run all over the Conventional Armed Forces in Europe Treaty. It, it, it exists on paper, but it's completely unpaid attention to. The U.S. unilaterally pulled out of the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty under George W. Bush back in 2003. And uh, Russia was, of course, extremely unhappy about that. Um, and, and in fact, in 2007, Putin iterated personally with the U.S. pulling out of the ABM Treaty INF Treaty, the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty, wasn't really in Russia's strategic interest anymore. But to prevent the whole security architecture from unraveling further, they said, well, we'll keep it for now. When the U.S. pulled out of the ABM tree unilaterally and started putting up missile defense in Eastern Europe uh, and then THAAD in South Korea and, and uh, naval a component scattered around the world, the, uh, also some in UK and interceptors in Alaska, various pieces layered that, you know, are designed to build and build over time and, and, and integrate uh, and advance, of course, in capability. This is when the, the, the arms race started. A lot of people are talking that because of the INF withdrawal will be in a new arms race. Well, you haven't been paying attention. We already are in a new arms race, and we have been for more than a decade now, and it started back then. Because as soon as the U.S. put up anti-ballistic, uh, pulled out of the ABM treaty, uh, that changed the logic of mutually assured destruction. It changed the strategic balance. And Russia said at the time, they said outright, we're going to have to develop capability to get around your ABM to maintain our strategic deterrence and the strategic balance and the logic of mutually assured destruction. And that's what they've done. And, and last year, Russia unveiled a whole host of uh, hypersonic and other weapons designed specifically uh, to, to be uh, unaffected by U.S. Uh, anti-ballistic missile, at least as it exists now, and it is likely to exist for the, for the next 20 years at least. And Russia said, we told you at the time you wouldn't listen to us, and, and this is what we've done. And we're now in a hypersonic arms race along with everything else. Hypersonic weapons allow you to uh, not only send missiles faster, but um, at um, uh, lower altitudes and maneuverable so they don't have to go into space you can't necessarily plot their trajectory uh, as you can all right you send an icbm into space it goes up at a certain trajectory and then you can you can detect where it's going to impact where it's going to land um, uh, hypersonic weapons are very fast and they move at a lower altitude and they can maneuver uh, so uh, and the, the existing ABM is, is completely useless. And, and this, unfortunately, is the logic of the new arms race, is that ABM will always be more expensive and behind the advance of missiles. It's much, much, much cheaper <laughs> to, to, and, and uh, easier to build missiles that can evade, whether you're talking uh, uh, countermeasures, decoys, false missiles, these are all really cheap versions, or, you know, something like these uh, new hypersonic weapons that Russia has uh, uh, not only developed, but is deploying. 
And the U.S. is is at least 10 to 15 years behind in that race right now. You're listening to RT International Affairs and Security Analyst Mark Sloboda. I continued by discussing reports that the INF Treaty was no longer workable for the U.S. because it did not include China, which now has intermediate-range missiles. You're absolutely correct. And there are, there are two big reasons why this treaty is actually archaic. And its, its end was probably inevitable. It, it Better it happened a different way, uh, but its end was, was, it was inevitable. It is, first of all, the technology. We've already touched on that with the new hypersonic missiles and everything. The fact that it only blocks land-based, not sea and air-based. And, and to give you an example of a, uh, a sea and air-based, the, the Tomahawk. The Tomahawk is an intermediate-range crew missile. It just happens to be launched from sea. Right. So it's perfectly legal. The same thing. The Russian has demonstrated the um, caliber to great effect in Syria. Right. It can fire from the Caspian Sea and hit technology. It, it, it doesn't affect sea and air. Doesn't it doesn't count hypersonic missiles and, and hypersonic glide vehicles and all these new advances that are coming out. So that's one reason. It's archaic. The other one is we're in a multipolar world now with with multiple great and regional powers, all with the ability uh, to build and and uh, to build these missiles and several of them that already have them. China, of course, is number one, and that's a concern uh, primarily for the U.S. but also uh, potentially for Russia. I mean, Russia and China are very good strategic partners, becoming allies at this moment. But militaries think in terms of contingency, the future, governments change, things change. Right? You have to think geopolitics and long range when you're doing military planning. But yes, um, China, India. Pakistan, uh, South Korea, Japan, the EU, France, the UK, Israel. Um, uh, these are all countries that could, could begin building intermediate range missiles, as, as several of them, of course, already have them that, we, that we've mentioned, Israel, uh, India, Pakistan, Iran. Right, North Korea. These are all intermediate range uh, missiles that, that, that they uh, possess. So um, it is in realist terms, a disadvantage to both the U.S. and Russia to remain bound by this treaty while other countries aren't. And we're not in a bipolar Cold War uh, world anymore. That, that that paradigm geopolitically doesn't exist. That That's the other reason why this treaty is archaic. And John Bolton hates international treaties. He's He's got a, he's got a hard on for anything that he views as constraining U.S. power. Uh, w- whether it's the UN, we know what he thinks of the UN from his time there, or he he's already gotten rid of at least four major treaties uh, uh, since he's been the National Security Advisor, uh, the INF Treaty, the JCPOA. I'm glad you brought him up because I mean this is one of the things I find it the most disturbing uh, about what's going on with our government because I mean Trump's campaign rhetoric would lead one to indicate that he was going to uh, end the regime change wars, or at least some of them, and that he wanted to improve relationships with Russia. But yet he surrounded himself with the very people that George H.W. Bush referred to as the crazies in the basement, uh, that he refused to allow to get upstairs and mess with policy. Uh, but these are the these are the people who are now you know right next to him in the Oval Office uh, making policy. That that's very disturbing. I think. I mean, we just had Elliot Abrams, you know, dug out of his undead grave and put in charge of 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 bringing a more quote democracy to Latin America, as if he hadn't already committed enough war crimes there uh, under the Reagan uh, Bush administrations. Uh, you know, Trump has has uh, gone completely, you know, uh, 180 on this in many ways. Uh, in other ways, uh, simply from a cost benefit analysis, he still seems intent on trying to get his military uh, to pull out of Syria and Afghanistan. Although they're already they're they're bucking at that, uh, you know, several different ways um, and trying to push back against that. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you can you can take a look at where. Uh, the Trump admin wants to end regime change wars, and that would be Syria uh, and and well, you could you could include Afghanistan in that uh, possibly. Certainly, it's the longest military occupation, and the intelligence community, the deep state, the blob, they don't want to pull out of that. Trump, as well as Bolton and Pompeo and everyone else, they want war with Iran. 
Uh, the um, the deep state they're they're not quite sure they want war with Iran yet. They're 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 pointing out that that Iran is still part of the JCPOA. Maybe that is part of that is a defense of Obama's legacy and so on. But there they're not in agreement. Um, at b- what the regime change they seem to both be able to agree on is is Venezuela, and and that's obviously moving forward and and may very well move from the open hybrid warfare and economic warfare phase to the to the uh into a potential military phase so it's not that trump doesn't want regime changes it's that he's got a different priority of re- regime changes uh from the deep state in some respects the technical reason for pulling out of the inf treaty the u.s pulling out of the inf treaty is they say that russia has violated that treaty by the development of a, of a missile, a, a what they say is a land-based variant of the caliber uh, sea-launched intermediate-range uh, cruise missile. And they say that its range exceeds 500 kilometers. Uh, Russia says, uh, no, it doesn't exceed 500 kilometers and, uh, and show evidence if you want to argue to the contrary. The U.S., of course, isn't going to reveal uh, sensitive information if it has it. Um, meanwhile, Russia has long maintained that the U.S. is violating the um, INF Treaty. Um, uh, several different ways, the most, the most, probably the most important of which is the U.S. has put up these anti-ballistic missile launchers uh, in Romania and soon in Poland. Now, these are MK-41 launchers. They are an Aegis Ashore system, which is just a modification of the Aegis system that is on uh, many uh, U.S. warships. And, and being a Navy vet, I'm, I'm pretty well familiar with them. These launchers can fire a variety of things, but including Tomahawk cruise missiles, which is actually one of their main uses at sea. The Aegis Ashore that's put in uh, Romania and soon in Poland is supposed to be to launch anti-ballistic missile missiles, missiles that can shoot down ICBMs and you know and other things. But there is very little reason to believe that they couldn't also be easily reconfigured to shoot cruise missiles, intermediate range, you know, whether, whether with a conventional warhead or a nuclear warhead as well. So not only do you get an ABM launcher, which you know, of course was a violation of the ABM treaty went before the U.S. pulled out of it. But Russia argues that the U.S. has stealth erected launchers uh, in uh, Eastern Europe as well, something that has dual capability. The argument that the U.S. has put back, oh, that's ridiculous, we're in complete compliance because we don't have any missiles there and it requires different software. I think you can probably understand why Russia doesn't accept that argument, because missiles could be delivered to Europe fairly quickly, you know, if the U.S. felt it was necessary in escalating situation and software, right? Okay, like, (laughs) Russia is probably not too upset with the U.S. pulling out of this treaty. It has already indicated before that it's not really in Russia's strategic interest since the U.S. pulled out of the ABM treaty. I think that it's true that both countries are probably in minor violation of the treaty. That, that's my reading of it, that both countries are. But that neither one presents a, either an existential threat to, to each other or to Europe. And that the real reason for the U.S. pulling out of this treaty is China. And Bolton and Trump both gave very strong indications of that when they spoke about withdrawing from the INF Treaty, they repeatedly mentioned China. That's their focus. And the reason for that is the U.S., the the generals, the brass, the the strategic thinkers, they are in the U.S., they are convinced that the U.S. is going to be fighting a major naval conflict with China on the other side of the Pacific in the South China Sea within the next 20 years. Um, they, They see that as inevitable. To con- necessary to contain China's, uh, you know, dominance and, and growth in the region. The U.S., of course, has sea and air launched, uh, you know, missiles there, um, but it would like land-based ones as well. And the reason for that is, of course, they're easier to install. You have a limited number of air uh, and sea launched, right, depending on how many subs or surface ships, what's firing them. 
uh, and, and aircraft, et cetera. Land-based are simply a lot more reliable. And there's a little bit of military separation here. You know, the Navy and the Air Force are getting money for these missiles. The Army would like a piece of that pie, too. They want to install missiles in Guam and Japan and probably South Korea, more, more thinking of North Korea up there. The reason for that, of course, is that China has a, a large arsenal of short and intermediate range conventional missiles that uh, can target uh, the U.S. Navy in any potential conflict in the, the Taiwan Straits or the South China Sea. And that's what the U.S. is really worried about. They're worried about carrier killer missiles and how China increasingly it seems to be getting the edge on the U.S. in that future potential naval conflict, and they want missiles there. Russia also is thinking of Japan. They're thinking of the United Kingdom. They're thinking of other, uh, you know, those are the major threats that they see right now. They both say that they have now suspended the treaty. The U.S. first, then Russia reciprocated. Uh, the U.S. has already, even last year, announced that they were allocating $58 million in the, in the uh, Pentagon budget to research a new uh, short intermediate range missiles. It's not hard. They've built them in the past. They actually have several of them now that Russia has complained about. They use them for uh, testing the anti-ballistic missile systems they have. They call them test missiles, but of course, they're, they're, they're short intermediate range uh, test missiles that function the same as, as you know, the real things do, uh, nearly at least. Both sides, I mean, they're not going to ne neglect the development of strategic weapons, of nuclear weapons uh, in the short and intermediate range. They won't. But both sides are actually far more concerned and interested in the development of uh, land-based short and intermediate range conventional weapons, cruise missiles, right? Cruise and other uh, hypersonic. Russia has responded. What the U.S. develop when the U.S. develops something, will develop something. When the U.S. deploys something, will deploy it. Right now, Russia does not think that European countries are going to accept the deployment of U.S. short and intermediate range missiles on Europe. So they say, you don't do that, and we won't target missiles at Europe. And that's the reason why Europe probably won't install them, uh, because they don't want to make themselves targets again. A couple of things that, that are very worrying to me about this, and one is, of course, that clearly uh, U.S. policymakers are seriously considering uh, the possibility of a nuclear first strike and the, and the theory yeah. that it is possible to win a nuclear war. The other thing is that even prior to the advent of Trump, Bolton, and Pompeo, it was very clear to the Russians, I mean, it, back in 2016, that the United States government was not agreement capable, as they put it, that it wasn't possible to arrive at an agreement. And that was when we had Kerry and Obama, who were relatively sane. Um, you know, there doesn't seem to be a way to climb back down. There doesn't seem to be a mechanism to climb down. Uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we've seen the U.S. pull out of the anti-ballistic missile treaty. We've seen the, uh, Trump pull out of the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. They're pulling out of the INF unilaterally, you know, even saying that Russia that Russia has made a violation. Russia says they've made a violation. Russia actually offered mutual inspections on both sides. As a, as a way of, of keeping the treaty and the U.S. turn them down because there can be no equivalency, as they, as they say. You know, we're not violating it. You are. So we, we, we can't even accept talk. Uh, during his State of the Union, uh, Trump did raise the possibility, however um, incredulous this might be, of a new treaty that might include China and others. And this would be the ideal situation, a new treaty. That would not only include China, but all of the other major powers. It would probably have to be done in the UN and it would have to include every country. And it might address, you know, theoretically, sea and air launch missiles, uh, intermediate range missiles as well. It might, it, it might address hypersonic weapons. It might address uh, underwater uh, uh, drones. It might address uh, hypersonic glide vehicles. It could address cyber warfare all these things that every great power is now developing that will really really change the face of future war and are super super deadly 
Uh, that's why this architecture is falling apart. And a new treaty will have to be, should be developed eventually. But of course, uh, no one actually believes that the U.S. is serious when they when Trump mentioned this. And certainly trying to convince China to join this, uh, much less other countries, is probably going to be impossible until everyone is shocked by the actual outbreak and the use of these weapons somewhere, you know, whether it's the conventional or the nuclear variant. What Russia is actually far more concerned about is the effect that this will have on the new START treaty, which is due to expire in two years. And that limits the amount of missiles and warheads uh, that that both Russia and the United States has. That will be the, the, the end of the final last pillar of the Cold War security architecture. R Russia definitely doesn't want that treaty gone, uh, but it will it will mean uh, a whole new level, a whole new escalation of arms race and a whole new geopolitical ball game. And all the more important that we start looking at new treaties that that do include other countries however much the the political will may not be there at the moment but that's really really what's needed new new countries involved addressing all kinds of new weapons and technologies it doesn't look like any country is is really moving in that way so far not not us not russia seriously i think both sides have violated in small ways um that aren't any type of real threat to each other and uh, it could have been maintained. Resolutions could have been found. The U.S. doesn't want to. Russia says, if you're not interested, we're not even going to bother to try. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's it's most likely gone in six months. Um, you know, it's it's got six from the suspension till the actual withdrawal is six months. But it, it, it's it's clearly indication that uh, it's probably gone. And there's no even push at the moment. Uh, for something new to to replace it so um it, it it's like i said it's not as much of a game changer as, as some people may think it is uh, concentration it probably of uh, at least at first is going to be more on conventional uh inter short intermediate range missiles land-based ones for both russia and um and the united states but you know uh, they won't neglect the strategic aspect either. And, that, you know, of course, that's what everyone is scared about. Well, I think we have a lot of reason to be. I think we're going to have to call it there. Uh, it's good, really good talking with you again. Thanks for having me. It's always yeah. an honor and a pleasure. All right, great. Take care, Mark. Take care, Charles. You've been listening to international affairs and security analyst Mark Sloboda speaking from Moscow via Skype. Mark is a regular guest on the excellent Crosstalk panel discussion show on RT Television. You can find the program on YouTube, if you don't get RT, on your local cable service. That is our show for this week. Widerview is available as a podcast at widerviewradio.podbean.com and also on iTunes and Google Play. Just search for Widerview Radio. If you have comments or questions about what you've heard, email me at widerviewradio at gmail.com or comment on our Facebook page at Wider View Radio. I'm your host, Charles Dunaway. Thanks for listening.